a series on memorial stones, and I'm telling uh, stories of the history of both our church and our fellowship, of uh, how we arrived where we are today and why we do what we do. We learn lessons along the way. And so if I get the uh, main text, which is Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, this is where uh, the title comes from, is that in uh, relationship with God, he wanted them to remember where they came from. And the stones are something you look back at to remind yourself and to make sure that you are uh, still lined up, and especially this is true for uh, in our text, it is instructing next generations. And this is one of the things that I am uh, doing uh, all over as I travel. People are saying how helpful it is that they were not here in the beginning. They're not from uh, Prescott. They're not even from America. But now they can learn where do we come from? Why do we do what we do? And so that is my point in teaching this. Let's begin uh, in today's lesson the first thought i want to look at is the importance of sunday schools and this is one of the foundational uh, parts of our church pastor mitchell the founder of our uh, fellowship he believed that sunday school is a very important part of a healthy church and of course we have sunday school for children uh, educating children in the principles of the Word of God in our church. We begin when they are three years old up and through the time they graduate high school. Uh, it can be 17, 18 years old. So in essence, for 16 years, you are able to put some Bible foundations into children, and that is uh, part of what we do. But in our church... We also have uh, adult Bible hour, adult Sunday school class, which is what I'm uh, teaching today. Uh, of course, originally we had Pastor Mitchell, got some photos. Pastor Mitchell uh, taught uh, Sunday school uh, in our church from 1970 uh, up until he probably taught his last class in 2019-2020, uh, or around about that time. And then, of course, uh, I'm teaching uh, this today. Pastor Mitchell did some classic series. I, I recommend every new pastor as they get a hold of a, an original series. I probably will redo it. it hasn't been done since the 70s, but uh, it's on the church. And that is a classic uh, entire teaching on what the church is. He did the altars of God, the mysteries of God, names of God. There were just many, many classic um, Sunday school series that he taught. So in Ephesians 4, it gives the fivefold gift ministry. Um, and uh, two of those that are named are pastor and teacher. And most Bible scholars say that should be pastor hyphen teacher. In other words, the pastor who preaches also should be one who teaches. And the main difference between uh, preaching and teaching in a Sunday school, it has to do with depth. You can go much deeper into whatever subject you are uh, uh, tackling Usually in a, I'm telling stories, so this is a very different than most of our uh, adult Bible classes, but usually you can include more scripture, and that would be 
there's more scripture involved than there is in a regular sermon. You can take your time and you can tackle it deeply. I did a, a series on rejection, uprooting rejection. And uh, uh, I had people that would come at various times and say how much that helped them. But part of the reason why I had preached on rejection for years, but you are preaching and touching on it here and there in a sermon, I was able to do, I don't remember off the top of my head, it seemed like 16 weeks in depth, every aspect of uh, rejection. And so that is something that is foundational because you are really putting in Bible foundation. The Bible should be the foundation of a healthy church. It should not be just personality. It is God's word. And so uh, Sunday school for adults is a very important part of that. Adult Sunday school is important for the pastor. And when you have pastors that enter the ministry, of course, I provide my material for free worldwide to whoever uh, would like it. But I encourage guys, it's fine for you to teach my material, but I encourage pastors who are beginning, you need to work on your own series because it helps you. We have, of course, in a couple of pictures, Pastor Jesse uh, also teaches, does an excellent job, Pastor Stephen both of them, they also teach. So when a pastor does a Sunday school series, what it does is it forces the pastor to dig deeper. You can't skim and uh, hit a subject in a drive-by. You have to dig in order. And so that some of those, I do different types of uh, Sunday schools. I do them on Bible words, Bible phrases. For me, those are very easy. I'm able to dig through that. Sometimes I am refuting false doctrine. I did Jewish roots. I did uh, uh, hyper grace, uh, different subjects that I am forced to dig into God's word to know how to refute uh, false doctrine. But that makes you dig. That's very, very healthy for a, a pastor. There are pastors that you are watching. I urge you to do your own uh, Bible classes. And then the other thing it does for the pastor is that it forces you in areas you wouldn't normally go. Uh, I did a series many years ago here. I don't even remember what the title of the series was, but in the, uh, in the subjects that I was following in the Bible, in the words, I had to do a lesson from Corinthians on lawsuits against believers. Now that's not something I would think of as a sermon I want to preach on whether it's right to sue another Christian. But uh, that was in the Bible class. It was very good for me to wrestle with that and to uh, think that through. It's very healthy for a pastor to dig deeply. But the reason why I am mentioning this in our history is Adult Sunday School is important for the church. The Prescott Church is a very biblically literate church. And that is because of years of not only preaching, but Bible foundations in this. What adult Bible class does is it puts strong doctrinal and biblical foundations in the church and foundations affect your salvation. Paul writes to believers in one of the epistles and he says his desire for them is that they be rooted and grounded in the truth. And so rooted is the idea of stability, uh, something you can draw from. Grounded is the idea of foundations. And that affects, one of the things that happens as you teach over time you want Christians to have a biblical worldview. Worldview is how you look at life and interpret. You come to conclusions. A biblical worldview causes you to look at life 
and interpret it correctly. And that is what happens in, in over time. You teach and teach and teach and teach. People instinctively now, new things arise in the world and people are able to look at that, not just what's popular, what do other people think, what does the Bible say? And then one of the profound things that strong teaching over time does is it provides protection against winds of doctrinal error. Ephesians 4, 13 and 14. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Okay, this is Ephesians 4. It's the same passage that I mentioned to you. God gave gifts to the church, the fivefold uh, uh, gift ministry, and two of those gifts are pastor teachers, pastors who can teach. And then it says, after telling us of those gifts, what do they do is they help us grow up or mature spiritually. What does it mean to be a mature believer? One of the things means winds of doctrine do not carry you to and fro. They don't move you away from what is correct. I have a, a unique perspective uh, on this. I, I pastored two churches in the same city at different times. And one of those was built originally. I didn't pioneer either of these, but I took over the, the churches one church was built on personality, a man who was extremely charismatic. Uh, I mean, he oozed charisma. It was built on hype, just lots and lots of shouting. Is, uh, that's a successful service. If everybody is shouting, everybody had a, a, a good time. The other church was not built on hype. It was built on the Word of God, the man who pioneered that church. Later years, he became a weasel, but at least when he pioneered, he, was, he did preach the Word of God. He was a, a preacher. So I pastored both of these churches at uh, different times. Uh, actually, I pastored one of the churches twice. When I came back the second time, now I'm pastoring the Word-based church church and on the other side of the town is the the hype based church and its foundation that was in the time when the brownsville revival how many of you remember that pensacola florida this uh, was a, a huge wave as typical they put in charisma magazine that there's revival people started flying from all over the world even foolish pastors from our fellowship started going what was actually happening there, sinners weren't being saved. Christians were tingling. You know, I heard angels singing all kinds of nonsense like that that was supposed to be powerful. So what happened was when Brownsville hit Australia, where these two churches were located in Melbourne, the hype church, Brownsville, devastated it. That church, most of the, the pastor, most of the people wound up leaving the fellowship. Only a handful of people survived, and very much a part of that was Brownsville. That spirit moved through. Church is devastated. The church founded on the word that I was pastoring. Only one person was lost when Brownsville came, and he wasn't a convert. He was actually a young man who had uh, come into our church from the assembly of God. And so the difference was the word. That's what, that's what teaching does. Actually, a funny story about this guy that was lost in the, in the second church. He came from the assembly of God. He was a man from India. And uh, he came and approached me. He had heard all about Brownsville, had attended a meeting somewhere. And he said, Pastor, this is wonderful. And I said, no, it's not. It's false doctrine. I showed him why biblically I disagreed with it. 
So he uh, didn't like that. And so we, are having, we were having a testimony service. And so people are, you know, I got a job, I got healed, whatever they're testifying about. He was going to sandbag me. He stood up to tell people that he disagreed with me and that he was leaving the church. And he was going to do this publicly. I, I'm sure in his mind he thought everybody was going to go, no, no, brother, stay in the church. Problem was our building was wooden. It was very echoey and had a very strong accent. So no one understood what he was saying. <laughs> I was the only one. I'm, I'm thinking, you sucker. He is publicly trying to cause it. And so he tells them, so this will be the last service. I'm never coming back. No one understood what he said. So when he finished, they all cheered. Yay! <laughs> he was like, just sat down <laughs> defeated. Anyway, <laughs> there is a God in heaven, I tell you what. So, but my point was that the word of God provided protection. Doctrinal people who had been founded in the word, they're hearing about this and they're going, nah. Those who didn't have doctrinal or biblical foundations, it affected them very badly. If, if any of the pastors are watching this, I urge you, if you do not, typically when your church gets to about 50 people, you need to have Sunday school because that will help your church. Let's talk secondly about the importance of structure. We came from the Foursquare Gospel Church. That's where my father was saved, trained, became a pastor in the Foursquare Gospel. Foursquare Gospel Church is a denomination. Denomination, the technical definition is a group that has common beliefs with centralized control, okay? You, you believe some of the same things, but what it means to be a denomination is centralized control, okay? Everything is run from headquarters or from uh, the offices, what, whatever they might be. My father saw how unhelpful that was. To him personally, he saw what that was producing. So when we began to plant churches in 1973, over time, as more churches uh, began to be planted, my father said, I do not want denomination. I do not want centralized control that is unhealthy. And so what evolved over time, I'm kind of putting several time periods together here, but what he came to was the idea of fellowship. Fellowship is a Bible word which means joint sharing. It means common cause. So the difference between a denomination that we used to be a part of and a fellowship is this. Fellowship means what, why are we together? Because we have common cause. We're not together because of a rule, a law, a bylaw. We choose to because we have common cause. And so... Fellowship, I, in a previous lesson, Pastor Mitchell began to have a Bible understanding of the indigenous principle. Indigenous means from within. And so as we began to uh, plant churches, of course it was natural people, whatever churches are planted, they're coming to conference. Pastor Mitchell said, I do not want to form a denomination to where Prescott uh, is Mecca and runs every decision. So he began to make steps to deliberately decentralize. In other words, he does not want every decision to be made from Prescott. So the first step in decentralizing or the indigenous principle had to do with church planting. In a denomination, remember what it means, centralized control. My father is saved in a church in Phoenix, Arizona. He goes to his pastor and says, I feel called. I want to preach. There is no mechanism within 
the denomination whereby you can become a pastor and fulfill your calling. So they told him, according to our bylaws and beliefs and rules, you have to go to the centralized Bible school. They are the ones who train pastors. And that's what he did. He moved to Los Angeles, California and uh, went to school for three years or however long it took him to uh, complete Bible college. And it was now the Bible college, which was run by the organization, they are the ones who licensed him and said, now you can be a pastor. But from the time that he left to go to Bible school, essentially his relationship with his home church is severed. You can say hi, you can visit, you can do, but they have nothing to do with your ministry from then on. Everything. Where do I start to pastor? That's up to the board. That's up to the, the organization. That is centralized control. Fellowship, we believe in the indigenous principle. Discipleship means di that disciples are made from within a local church. So in church planting, number one, every congregation are responsible for training their own men. And it happens from within. If we have a convert who says, I feel called to preach, we don't send them away we can train them in-house from within. And then when it comes time to plant a church, someone says, I feel stirred to go and I, I want to preach. That is decided from within. No church has to contact headquarters and ask, would it be okay if I plant a church? That's indigenous. That is from Within, So each church, the first part of this is each church trains their own men and each church plants their own men. And the reason why we do that is we say they know their people best. You have to understand, when a man wants to become a pastor, often the people making the decision, they don't know that man. Some of the people who made decisions about where my father would go pastor, they didn't know him from a bar of soap. It was simply he was within the structure. That is not how we operate. Man is going to plant a church. We figure that pastor knows his own disciple best. Is that man ready? You're the best judge of whether they are ready. And... That pastor who sends them has to take responsibility for them. That was one of the frustrations of my father in the denomination is when he needed something, you're talking to people who don't know you. They have no personal connection, offering help. It's not relational based. It's just simply, this is our job. You can uh, uh, come to us. Okay. Then, uh, so we uh, first were planting Flagstaff, Tucson. These were some of the first churches. Then Flagstaff and Tucson began to plant their own works. So now there is second generation churches. They started planting uh, on their own. And so that was totally their choice. Pastor Mitchell did not say yay or nay on whether you can plant a church. That's on you because it's indigenous. Now, over time, we did come to some common sense conclusions, and that is as conferences develop, we say to men, even today, you train the men, you want to plant them, that's up to you, but we say don't plant them except in a conference. And uh, uh, the reason why, if we have a guy that just on a Wednesday night, they decided to plant a church, then conference, you're robbing the, the conference dynamic. Conferences are supernatural. If something happens to people when they come in, they're hearing a challenge of obedience to the call of God that leads up to Thursday night we plant internationally, Friday night we plant 
uh, uh, domestically, if everybody is planting on their own, that dynamic is going to be robbed. In other words, church planting is the demonstration of all that we've been preaching through the week, right? Surrender to the call of God. What does that mean? That means on Friday night, surrendering to the call of God is going to preach. I uh, mentioned the uh, couple that was just sent out of 29 Palms, uh, Brady and his wife, they, were, they just took over the church in uh, Lake Havasu City, is Brady, I, uh, was, uh, uh, his wife had gotten saved, he was not saved, but numbers, he worked, uh, he was in the Marines, and on the base in 29 Palms, some of the men in his unit were witnessing to him, and they told him, we're going to conference next week, and so they said, why don't you come with us? And so Brady, who was not even saved, they didn't tell us this, but they snuck him into the hotel, let him sleep on the floor or something like that. So Brady comes to a conference. Monday night, he gets saved. Tuesday, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he's in an atmosphere where they're talking about doing the will of God. Friday night, there's a call, or on Friday, there was a call to who would like to preach the gospel. Certain people responded, and then couples are sent out. And when he saw that, God did something in him. He went up to Jake Snyder, the pastor, and said, would you send me out? And Jake is like, who are you? <laughs> you know, and that is exactly what happened. That dynamic is what we are creating. So we say to guys, don't plan except for in a conference. But then the big thing is that uh, a small church over time, you can't sustain church planting and, and world evangelism. Okay. So this gives the idea of the decisions of church planting are made from within. The training of workers is from within. But then Pastor Mitchell made the second decision of decentralization or the indigenous principle. It had to do with outside conferences. Pastor Mitchell was concerned that people would start viewing Prescott as we can't make a decision unless Prescott says so. So he deliberately had Flagstaff and Tucson start having their own conferences. And uh, this was for, you know, number one is practical. Not everybody could fit in our building. Right By the end, when we did the last conference, our, I think the official seating capacity of our building was 500 something. By the end, we were fitting 1,400. Uh, very dangerous. The fire department were not happy with us. So literally, not everybody can fit. It's a practical. But the idea is that if you have more conferences, more people can come into that atmosphere. They can be touched like Brady was touched. They can be stirred for the, for the call of God in that. And so this is what we did is that uh, in, the, in the 70s then we started uh, conferences in Flagstaff in Tucson. We have some pictures here. Uh, this is Flagstaff, uh, early days in the church there and uh, in a conference. And then the next picture also in Flagstaff, these two pictures here is they are laying hands on workers, praying for workers, just like we would do in Prescott, but now it's being done in Flagstaff. So they're taking responsibility, and then more people are, allowed, uh, are able to be a part of that. Tucson, next photos. Tucson, then they began having their uh, own. There's uh, uh, Larry Beauregard. Uh, back there, Eric Strutz, a young Eric Strutz uh, in the background. Next picture, we have a number of pictures here. Uh, some others that you may recognize. There's Paul Campo on the far left. Uh, next picture, uh, here is Pastor Mitchell and Harold Warner in Tucson in an early conference and preaching. Next picture, I think we have numbers of them. Here is the laying on of hands, just like we would do in Prescott. They were laying hands, ordaining couples into the ministry. Next photo here are several. And now uh, there is Harold Warner when they're launching out uh, Paul and Renee Stevens at some point and laid hands on them. 
And then here is, uh, I think that's my dad and Harold Warner laying hands on a worker. So the point of this was that we decentralized so that more people could begin to uh, experience that conference dynamic. Then, many years later, we came to a conclusion about starting new conferences. So, human nature never changes. Remember the disciples? The disciples are fighting about who's the greatest. That, that never changes. You have people, there. it's supposed to be all about Jesus, but there are people, they are lusting for attention and power. There are guys, they would love to be a conference uh, center. So we've, over time, we came to a conclusion that is when you start planting churches, when you reach 25, whether that is 25 that you personally launch or you launch some and they launch some, when that number reaches 25, then we spin them off into they now have their own conference. That happened this year. Uh, I preached the first conference in Ogden, Utah. Uh, Rick Martinez is there. They have reached more than 25, and so uh, they now become a conference center, repeating everything that we would do uh, in Prescott. So there's a logic to this, this structure. The first thing is at 25, if you have a conference and a guy only has three churches, it may be you get a guy that he might not plant a church, but every few years, you want ideally in a conference, every single conference people to be planted. Less than 25, you may not be able to do that. At 25, it is likely now between the mother church and other church planting churches, there will, you will sustain church planting every time people come to conference, they will see the end result of all this challenge to do the will of God is church planting. But then there's a second practical reason why we say 25. As you know in our conferences, Friday nights we plant churches domestically in the nation of whatever here in America we're planting in America. That's Friday night announcements. Thursday night we plant internationally. International church plant, uh, planting is and can be much more expensive than domestic planting. And so a small church cannot afford to plant internationally in many cases. Uh, Japan, for instance, Tokyo, Japan. We uh, funded uh, a worker who went to Tokyo, Japan, I think in four years, maybe it was five years, it, we put $625,000 into Japan. That's a lot of money. But so if you had a small church, there's no way that they could afford international church planting. When you get 25 churches and they are partnering together, then it becomes possible. So this brings us to in our church, we believe in tithing. We believe that every, uh, every believer, if you're a Christian, you should tithe 10% of your income. And that is an obedience to God. That's a symbol of submission. People who don't tithe, they have heart problems. They don't have money problems. They have heart problems. And so we believe that. We also practice tithing when we plant churches. When we plant a church, they tithe back to the mother church 10% of their regular income, not pledges, not building fund, nothing, just regular tithes and offerings. That is what is used for international church planting. That is the logic behind it. Number one, it is, of course, in the same way as a person is surrendered to the Lord, how do we know when they tithe? That's an outward sign. Tithing is also a, a sign of submission. We agree with the mission. We want to be a part of that, and then it helps fund uh, world evangelism. And so how that works, direct church plants tithe 10%. 
if we plant a church and then they plant a church, the granddaughter, the first church is our daughter church, the granddaughter church tithes 10%, but they split it 5% to their mother church, 5% to the grandmother church. If they plant a church, we get nothing, then it's 5% to the mother church and on and on and on. What happens when a church reaches 25, we change that tithe structure. That means that you may have churches, uh, Ogden churches were planting and they may have been splitting 5% to Ogden, 5% to uh, the mother church. When they become a mother church or, or a conference church, that stops. Now all direct church plants, they fund 10% there and then it's five and five to the conference church. So in other words, we have thousands of churches around the world that no money comes to Prescott whatsoever. It's not a giant money-making scheme. We believe in the indigenous principle, every conference center, we want them to be able to afford international church planting, and that is the point of it. And every time there is a new conference center, all of the associated churches, that's what happens. Direct church plants, 10%. Daughter, granddaughter, five and five, on and on. International church planting. So that is what we do. This has to do with our conferences. One last thing we'll look at today is the power of providence. This is a repeated theme you're going to find all through our series. It has to do with the lesson of God who arranges thing to work his will in advance. Let's read Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Okay, I have sayings, sometimes people write my sayings down. One of my sayings is God is really, really smart. This scripture talks about how smart God is. How smart is he? God says, I know what's going to happen before it ever happens. In fact, I plan things to happen in advance. And good things happen, bad things happen. It all works to what I planned in advance. My parents were saved. Dad felt called. His pastor said, the only option is go to Bible College, which is located in Los Angeles, California. They did this. They lived in a duplex. Their next door neighbors, they became friends with them. And the mother especially became, or the wife rather, became friends with uh, my mom. That couple, my parents graduated, uh, left that couple wound up divorcing. And over time, this woman met a man from Holland and she remarried this man from Holland, moved to Holland with him and would occasionally keep touch with my mom, which back then that was by mail. You wrote that and so they uh, had uh, some level of, of contact. The Jesus movement that birthed our church was not just in the United States. It often began, most scholars believe it started in California, uh, starting in San Francisco, working it down to Southern California, and then spreading throughout the U.S. But that same move of God that was drawing young people in a delayed wave started touching other nations. Last week I began, we'll return to Australia, I think maybe next week, but uh, Australia, it was just, it was behind, it's like the wave started hitting there of openness, but this was true. Canada, Dave Marks talks about the, the Jesus movement impacting Canada. So now this is what happened in Holland. Young people started being open to the gospel and getting saved. Teens to early 20s, they started being powerfully touched uh, in Holland. And so what began is that as they would get saved, 
they would start Bible studies because the church there was very dry, Dutch Reformed church and whatever was on uh, offer in Holland, very dry. So they would start Bible studies of these young people that were alive. This couple, the woman that my parents used to live next door to, now her husband is instrumental in Holland. He began meeting with these Bible study groups all through Holland. We have some pictures from olden times there. This is an early uh, Bible study. This is very European. You see there a lady with her cigarette at Bible studies. Try that this week. See how that works in <laughs> your Bible study. But this is what God uh, uh, was uh, uh, doing. And so it was almost all young people. And so this lady is in touch with mom telling what God is doing in Holland. Mom is telling what's happening in America. Mom and dad went on a tour to Israel and as part of the tour on the way there, they said, we're gonna have an entire day in Amsterdam. And so they wrote and arranged for this couple to come. They got permission to let them ride around with them on the bus for an entire day and this man began to tell dad what he was doing, what God was doing there. And dad gave him the advice, starting Bible studies is great, but he said, you need to start a church. God's plan is the church. And he said, if you will start a church, we will help you. So out of the numbers of Bible studies that he was involved with throughout Holland, he chose a small city called Steinweik. In March 18, 1979, the first church in Holland was birthed. And so we have some, uh, this is just telling the date that it started. And then we have a few pictures of the young church. This is, this is uh, Bart Koiker, uh, who now is a, a pastor, long-term pastor and uh, missionary, Eddie Van Dierman, who was one of the first pastors uh, uh, as well. And so in that small city of Steinweig, a church was birthed, and that was our first church in Holland, but actually it was our first church in Europe. Uh, up until that time, we had churches in uh, the United States, Mexico, Australia had just begun, and now we have a church in Holland. Very interesting story. Bart Quaker. Bart Quaker is the one on the right, and he's the one behind the pulpit there. Bart was uh, uh, young. He's a teenager. He had been dating Wilma. For three years, Bart was alive with Jesus. He's excited. He was traveling with the pastor all over Holland before he was a pastor, just helping him with these uh, different Bible studies. Wilma was tired of this because he was always gone. And so she asked him, we want to get married. Stop going to all these Bible studies. And Bart felt he was doing the will of God. He said, no, I will not stop. And so Wilma took off her ring and threw it at him and broke off the engagement that they had going for three weeks. That same, or three years rather, I'm sorry. That same... <laughs> It was a lengthy relationship. <laughs> that same week that they broke up was the week that they had arranged, Pastor Mitchell was gonna preach in Holland for the first time and they had arranged in a city called Harlem. They were gonna do some meetings and so Wilma who had just broken up because he was gonna keep going, she called and said, could I go with you to the, uh, these meetings with Pastor Mitchell? And he said, yes. Pastor Mitchell, his take was the meeting was extremely difficult. The man translating was rebellious. He didn't agree with what Pastor Mitchell was preaching. So in my dad's mind, it wasn't a very good meeting. But what happened in the altar call, Wilma was sitting in her seat and God spontaneously filled her with the Holy Spirit. She started speaking in tongues. She hadn't even gone forward to pray. God just powerfully touched her and filled her with the Holy Spirit. She was completely transformed, willing to follow Jesus. Bart and Wilma later got married. They became pastors. Now they are uh, uh, missionaries in uh, 
Brno in the Czech Republic. So in Holland, the work began. They began openly evangelizing. They began doing what they heard about in Prescott and in the American churches. We have a number of photos from the early days. Here's an early outreach group. They are uh, going to uh, witness and march in the streets. Next uh, photo here is witnessing. Uh, I think one of those is Wilma, if I'm not uh, mistaken. She is one uh, witnessing on the street here. The next photo is a picture. This is Bart Quaker street preaching for the very first time. And now boldly telling they had heard about this in America. Now they're doing it. You have to understand, they, none of these people had been with us. But they began repeating what they had heard we did. Next one, street drama. Here is an early street drama, Jesus uh, on the cross. And then finally, uh, they were getting converts, baptism. And there on the right, that is Bart Quaker uh, helping to uh, baptize. And so this Dutch pastor that married the woman that my parents knew, he had a vision for spreading the gospel uh, across Europe. He didn't just want the gospel to be in Holland. He said, we can reach Europe. And that was the vision that God put in his heart. We have a, a photo. This is an early impact team that they went to another nation. And now they are going outside of Holland. Uh, if I remember right, this is Germany. Uh, we didn't have churches there, but they were going because that man had a vision to reach Europe. Now a problem came. Pastor Butcher got a call from a young man who is a teenager and he said, the pastor is immoral. He's sleeping with ladies in the church. And so uh, dad gave the, but now imagine this man doesn't know my father. And so my father now over the telephone is saying, the pastor who is immoral can't stay pastoring. So you, you need to remove him but this man was a teenager and he said, why don't we give him another chance? My dad doesn't run them. He didn't really know them. They had just begun. And so he said, it's not gonna work, but whatever, that was what the man wanted to do. And so he wound up being immoral, sleeping with more girls. And so this actually became a foundational lesson in our fellowship. God forbid, if we have a pastor that is immoral, the people in the church are not equipped to handle that. It must be dealt with from outside. A pastor, a leader, someone else is going to have to uh, deal with that and uh, remove them and, and discipline them. So out of necessity, so that they've only just started and now the pastor is disqualified and removed. So out of necessity, dad appointed this young couple, the man was 19 years old, you have to be the pastor because we have no options. And so that is what he did. Uh, the previous pastor had run up what was for them a huge amount of debt. Back then their money was called guilders, 7,000 guilders. Pastor Mitchell immediately sent the money, said we will help you, paid off all of the debt so that they were able to function. And then, American pastors started going every single month to help the churches in Holland. We uh, uh, began to see the next photo, preachers started being raised up. So now discipleship, what worked in Prescott, now as they began to repeat, they're even just hearing about how we do things. Pastors who are visiting are giving instruction as they can they began to raise up, both of these men ultimately became uh, uh, pastors. Bart Quaker on the right is uh, still pastoring uh, uh, today. And so the works in Holland are a miracle. Think about how smart God is. God knew that a lady was going to live next door to my parents and would wind up living in Holland. But God says, I plan in advance and so the works in Holland are a miracle. From a random meeting in the past, a man who has character issues, 
a pastor who takes over as a teenager. Right now, there are 60 churches in Holland, and they have planted another 57 churches in 19 different nations. And the works of God are a miracle. Amen. Very, very powerful. I'm going this week to do a healing crusade and then on into the conference in Holland. And it is an absolutely a miracle. Last photo I want to show you as I uh, have been telling you that uh, one of the treasures I have, I have my dad's old Bibles, which is a living record of his relationship with God. And here is uh, a note and uh, in this Scripture in the Bible, he has underlined, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you brought me thus far? And the note that he wrote, Prescott slash and the fellowship, he said, this is God's work. And this is why. Listen, he, you heard my father say again and again, this is a work of God. How do I know it's a work of God? Because we have stories like that in Holland. Only God could arrange that. And that is what we do. We begin to discover, as we said, this is now uh, the third nation outside of America that we planted churches in. And we discovered that the gospel works everywhere and the indigenous principle of discipleship from within, church planting from within, that works all over the world. And that is what God has continued. And I declare to you, what we're a part of is a work of God. No man could dream this up. It is a miracle of God, and we rejoice in God's goodness. Thank God. We're going to stop there, and the service will begin at 1030. God bless you.